れが北海道世界選手権で4位と、ちょっと後があったので、スタート、これやるためにちょっと前に出させてもらいました。Okay, so、um, let's start our、um, press briefings. So,、um, today we're going to introduce、um, touchdown and、uh, scientific findings from Hayabusa 2.、Uh, those are really exciting.、Um, there are four、uh, panels here. Uh, first of all,、uh, you each to the、uh, project manager,、uh, Seichiro Watanabe,、uh, project scientist.、Uh, third, a lot of Milliken,、uh, co investigator of、uh, near infrared spectrometer. And the last,、uh, Seiji Sugita,、uh, principal investigator of optical navigation camera. So、uh, let's start.、Uh, please start、uh, Yuichi Tsuda. Okay, so uh, hello, um, I'm Yuichi Tsuda, the project manager of Hayabusa 2, and I'm very、really、pleased and the honor to uh, uh, present uh, today. The, the、uh, major accomplishments we have done in the Hayabusa 2 mission. So, uh, 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 Hayabusa 2 mission is a sample return mission to、uh, the C type asteroid Ryugu, which is a carbon rich、uh, asteroid. And we have been there for about seven months, and we have done various t y p e of、uh, operations there. But uh, today, uh, uh, we, are we would like to focus on two uh, uh, accomplishments. The first one、uh, I will present about the, the、uh, suc successful touchdown on the sample collection on Ryugu. And、uh, the following that, the、uh, three、uh, gentlemen sitting here will uh, uh, present about the science、uh, accompli accomplishments <coughs> that,、uh, that will be,、uh, that is to be published today, today in Science Journal. So, here I、uh, put some、uh, basic information about, about Hayabusa 2, but、uh, let me skip these because the time is limited. This is a spacecraft overview, and this is a mission flow from the launch until the Earth return, and、uh, this is a Ryugu. So,、uh, this appearance is just uh, uh, revealed、uh, after we reach the Ryugu, and th there are many findings. But the, the, the biggest challenges we, fa we have been faced、uh, in terms of、uh, operation planning and uh, the, also the engineering wise is that, that Ryugu is covered by、uh, numerous boulders all over the globe, which is unsafe for the spacecraft landing. So, because of that, the, originally we planned to, we planned to、uh, land on the, on the, on the Ryugu、uh, last October, but we postponed that. To、uh, thoroughly assess the、uh, safety of the landing and the improve, the,、uh, improve the landing accuracy. And、uh, as a result of the, that, we、uh, decided to do the touchdown operation、uh, just one month ago, the、uh, 22nd of February, and that was、uh, succeeded. And、uh, this is the,、uh, another accomplishment we have done before the touchdown. We already delivered uh, the uh, three rovers and landers on the surface of asteroids. Those three are all successful and, uh, uh, and did a very uh, uh, excellent uh, observation on the surface、uh, on the asteroid. And, and even they, are, they, they successfully hop and move all over,、uh, on, over, the, over the surface of the、uh, Ryugu. And uh, the, uh, back to the、uh, landing of the spacecraft itself. The first, the,、uh, originally, our spacecraft, spacecraft allows the only,、uh, about the 50 meter、uh, landing accuracy. That's the original design. 
But after arrival of Ryugu, we found that there are no such place uh, uh, with, with, with like 100 meter uh, uh, diameter safe place. And so we decided to uh, shrink, shrink, shrink down the, uh, the landing site to uh, down to 20 meter diameter, he, oh, sorry, here. So this is the original uh, landing target, 100 meter by 100 meter square. Uh, but uh, later we, we uh, shrink, shrunk down that tar landing target to 20 meter. As you can see here, just outside this 20 meter diam uh, the circle, uh, there are several rocks uh, with uh, um, like two meter or four, four meter, uh, which is dangerous for the spacecraft landing. <coughs> so instead of doing the touching down on October, we decided to, to deploy the target marker first uh, to precisely evaluate the land, our landing accuracy. So uh, the target marker is uh, basically a 10 centimeter ball uh, with, uh, uh, covered by uh, their high reflectivity clothes, clothes. And by using the flashlight equipped on the spacecraft side, uh, the spacecraft can detect, autonomously detect this uh, target marker as a visual marker for, for the autonomous <coughs> guidance na terrain, relative navigation guidance. And that was successful. And, and then uh, the, the actual, location that target marker was dropped is here, which is only 15 meter away from the original landing target. So a uh, 15 meter is a very, very good result in terms of engineering uh, because the, our original design was 50 meter, but still we, it's not sufficient for this uh, very severe environment of Ryugu. So uh, after the, the doing this target marker drop operation, we uh, evaluated uh, more thoroughly about the terrain, and we found, found out uh, two uh, candidate regions uh, to, to make a touchdown. The first one is a little bit farther from the target marker, but, uh, but uh, wider at one, the, which is designated, designated as L08B1. And the other one is the L08E1, which is more closer to the target marker, but very small, smaller, uh, only uh, about six meter diameter. And after uh, the uh, very thorough assessment, we decided to go to this one, L08E1, uh, because which, uh, which is closer to, it is closer to the target marker, so it's easier for, for the spacecraft to realize, to meet the uh, six meter uh, landing accuracy. And this is one of the, uh, the, uh, the Monte Carlo simulations before we do the touchdown operation. And you can see that uh, the older solution is uh, the fit, fit with, within the uh, six meter landing zone. And based on these, we conducted the, the landing operation. And the, to realize this very high, uh, uh, high precision landing, we have done many, many things for uh, spending for four months. And this, is, uh, this page is showing that the scientific activity re re uh, related to this uh, precision touchdown. And we integrated the uh, in-city observation data from uh, rovers and also the uh, optical navigation camera, uh, close-up view of the uh, ONC camera. And also we did a, a laboratory experiment to ensure that we, could, we can uh, get uh, the, uh, enough amount of, of samples from the targeted area. And, and the, the most in important thing is to make the mo as accurate terrain model as possible to, to, to confirm our landing safety. And by combining all this information, we achieved, we concluded to, to the, the landing accuracy was improved to 2.7 meter, which was a drastic imp improvement from the original 50 meter landing. And this is the resulting uh, pinpoint touchdown sequence in the movie. So uh, 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 below 45 meter, the everything is, uh, is going autonomously. And the uh, key point here is that we, uh, we actively use, utilize the target marker as a pivot of our uh, guidance and navigation. And by doing so, we can, uh, uh, we can accomplish very high precision landing autonomously. And uh, after going dive into the 8.5 meter uh, by lo just looking at the target marker, then uh, m the spacecraft moves to horizontally to to shift to the uh, 
uh, just above the uh, landing site, uh, landing zone, which is four meters away from the target marker, and then make a free fall. And finally, touching down. And as the spacecraft detects, detects touchdown, the bullet is ejected, and the, the reflected fragment will be collected in the, to the, in the root of the uh, sampler horn, and then transported to the uh, reentry capsule. And then uh, this is the uh, new movie that uh, I, we are going to, sh to release today. Uh, this is basically a target marker tracking movie uh, viewed from the spacecraft, and that was actually used for the uh, autonomous navigation. So please uh, see this. So the, there's a bright, one bright spot, which is a target marker. And after detecting the target marker, the spacecraft moves horizontally to to put this, put that spacecraft, uh, to, to put the, that target marker at, at the center of the uh, image, and then dive into 8.5 meter like this, and still keeping a lock at, at the center of the image. Yeah, and once it's locked, then the target uh, is shifted like this to, to, to make the spacecraft move to the uh, offset position for the final land, to forward preparation of the final landing. And that was very, very successful. And right after this, the spacecraft uh, did, did the final descent. And this is a movie uh, about, uh, showing the final descent phase from 8.5 meter to the zero meter, which was already uh, released a few weeks ago. And this is the uh, uh, movie from the sampler home monitor camera uh, looking at the uh, sampler horn here, and the spacecraft is going down, going down, and make a touchdown. And just a, a few seconds, like two seconds, the spacecraft ejected the bullet. And because of that, many fragments are moving upward. And that's a beautiful picture, and we are actually surprised about this very drastic reaction. And this is a clear evidence that we actually touches the ground of, of Ryugu. And this is the, another uh, movie that uh, we, are, we will show uh, today. And this is a sequence of images uh, uh, by ONC W1 camera uh, showing the reaction of the touching down. So it's a kind of uh, bird eye view uh, looking at the, uh, the place where the spacecraft touches down from the uh, high altitude. And you can see that it's a, a kind of a violent <laughs> uh, motion uh, reaction uh, on the ground. And for example, if you focus on here, there are some uh, big rocks moving because of the uh, uh, thruster plume. And this is n not a small rocks, like 50 centimeter to one meter rocks. So, and that kind of, those kind of big rocks can move uh, and rolling uh, as a reaction to the uh, thruster plume on a touching down. And another thing you can see is the, uh, the dust, kind of dust, a uh, black, blacky dust uh, ejected from the touch, the, where the spacecraft touches down. And we, estimate, we are estimating that this is a material ejected from the touchdown site. And what is interesting here is that the, 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 the material seems uh, darker than the, the uh, material that covers the surface, which means that it might be the uh, internal, internal material uh, might be uh, the black, more black than the surface. That's very interesting in term, uh, in, from the science point of, point of view. And then this is the achieved learning accuracy. Uh, and the, what we made the, uh, actually one meter, uh, one meter accuracy uh, uh, as a result. So the requirement is three meter, but we achieved that one meter. That is uh, satisfactory in, a, <coughs> in any as aspects. And we al already uh, identify where we collected the sample, sample, which is here, which is very close to the center of the, uh, the landing zone. So this is a summary. And the, I, let me just one, uh, add one thing that the, uh, the, we already closed the sample chamber A. Uh, we have three uh, chambers 
uh, to isolate the, uh, the samples from three different touchdown sites. And we, uh, so the, sample, the collected sample has been already secured in, in, the, in the body of the spacecraft. Uh, the next thing we will do is the uh, uh, kinetic impact experiment or the making the artificial crater on the surface of an asteroid uh, that will be going to be held in April 5th. And then we will go in November or December 2019, and one year later we will return to the Earth in November or December 2020. So that's from uh, all from me, and uh, let me hand over to Seichiro san. Hi. <coughs> Good afternoon. I'm Seichiro Watanabe, Nagoya University, uh, Project Science to Hayabusa 2. I introduced our paper entitled Hayabusa 2 arrived at the Carbonaceous Satellite View, a spinning top shaped rubble pile, published online by the journal Science Today. Hayabusa 2 spacecraft arrived at the Carbonaceous Satellite in June 2018, conducting remote sensing observation and gravity measurement. Three papers based on the hypothesis of variation of Bugu are published online by Science Today. This is one of the papers. We discuss the shape and structure of Bugu based on the shape model reconstructed from observation and other physical data. The main results are Bugu is a rubble pile asteroid. The spinning top shape with a prominent equatorial ridge of Bugu was probably formed by a past rapid rotation and we identify a suite of sampling collection site on the equatorial ridge. Based on optical camera images and radar lensing data, we reconstructed two types of shape model, SFM and SPC. The, the both are very similar, so the shape is reliable. We analyze the shape of Ryugu and find the following results. Result one, we found Ryugu is a rubble pile asteroid because the because bulk density of Ryugu is 1.19 gram per cubic centimeter. If so, uh, Ryugu's Porosity is more than 50%. Another, uh, another supporting evidence is abundant large boulders on its surface. These boulders are most likely fragments that are created during the formation of Ryugu after disruption of its parent body. These strongly support Ryugu is a rubble pile asteroid. Result 2. Spinning top shape of Ryugu was formed by a past rapid rotation. Ryugu's shape may have been produced by rotational induced deformation. Most of the known top shape are rapid rotator, but Ryugu is rather slow. The rotation period is 7.63 hours. Our surface slope analysis show the variation in surface slope become minimum at spin period of 3.5 hours. A possible scenario may result from the late stage rotation acceleration. Deformation will occur either in the interior or on the surface, depending on the internal structure. Numerical simulation shows that the interior failure occurs if Ryugu has a uniform weak interior. But we don't uh, we cannot rule out the substrand slide if the interior is heterogeneous. Result three, identification of a sample site. Color analysis show, color analysis show uh, bright bluish material on the equatorial ridge indicating the freshness if the effect of space exposure lead to reddening and darkening. Based on these comprehensive assessments, we identify a potential landing site L08 on the equatorial ridge to perform a material sampling. Perspectives. This study shows that the formation process of the asteroid shape is closely related to the material strength. 
SCI impact experiment plan in April will provide us further information on strength of the surface layer of bugle. Sample to be returned will reveal the chronology of material on the equatorial ridge. Then we can distinguish the formation scenario of the spinning top shape. Comparative study of Ryuga and Benu will tell us their commonalities and individualities. Finally, strength of carbonaceous acid is the key to clarify the delivery processes of water and organic to the early earth. This is appendix. That's all. Okay. Thank you. I'm Ralph Milliken from Brown University, a co-investigator on the NEARS-3 near-infrared spectrometer on the Hibosa-2 spacecraft, and today I'll be presenting the results of our paper published in Science on behalf of the entire NEARS-3 team. Uh, and for the details of what I'll be presenting today, I refer you to the paper that is led by the PI of the uh, instrument, uh, Professor Kohei Kitazato. Uh, NEARS-3, uh, first of all I mentioned, is a near-infrared reflectance spectrometer. So what the instrument is measuring is the sunlight, the amount of sunlight that is reflected off of the object, in this case Ryugu, at near-infrared wavelengths. Uh, and we are measuring uh, wavelengths over 1.8 to 3.2 microns, again, so near-infrared energy. And we use this information on many planetary missions to tell us about the composition and specific minerals that are present on planetary surfaces. And we can also use it to assess the overall reflectance properties at near-infrared wavelengths in this case. And we have several key findings uh, that are published in the science paper. The first is that the surface of Ryugu is extremely dark. And here uh, we have this model, this 3D print model of Ryugu. And you can see um, it is, it is uh, black as printed. And although I don't know the absolute reflectance of this exact model, I suspect it is brighter than the actual surface of Ryugu, which is quite impressive. In fact, Ryugu is darker than most of the carbonaceous chondrite meteorites that we measure in our laboratory that we think may derive from these types of objects. So it's extremely dark. It is also dark uh, pretty much over all of its surface, although there are some subtle variations in the overall reflectance, and that's shown in this diagram here. Those variations are, for the most part, relatively subtle. And on average, Ryugu reflects a little bit less than 2% of all of the sunlight that reaches it at these wavelengths. So again, it's a very dark object. The other thing that we note about Ryugu uh, is related to its overall surface composition. Uh, the spectrum or reflectance pattern of Ryugu is generally quite flat at these wavelengths and energies. However, in every single spectrum acquired so far with the mission, we do observe a weak feature, an absorption feature at 2.7 microns, so sunlight's being absorbed at that wavelength, that is diagnostic of the presence of, uh, the presence of OH, or uh, we can colloquially think of this as just water. So there is evidence of water on uh, Ryugu. We do not have any strong evidence as of yet for the presence of H2O, molecular water, but we are still analyzing the data and collecting new data, uh, and so there's more to come uh, in the future. But we do see the presence of OH, hydroxyl, across the entire surface of Ryugu. Uh, the position of this absorption feature does not appear to vary. Um, the strength um, also does not appear to vary um, uh, quite very strongly. Uh, this is something we're looking into. And so it seems to be quite a homogeneous surface composition across Ryugu, uh, and that is something that, again, is a uh, primary finding that is presented in the science paper. And we believe this uh, particular hydroxide, uh, hydroxyl, is associated with a uh, cation magnesium. This is something that is observed in a number of carbonaceous chondrite meteorites that is often indicative of the presence of clay minerals. So these would be magnesium hydroxyl uh, components of clay minerals. And so this is evidence that the, uh, the surface of Ryugo and its components once did interact with water, but if we look at the actual reflectance spec for themselves, what we observe, shown in black here in the nearest three data, uh, it is very dark, very flat, and this OH feature is extremely weak. This is kind of a zoom in comparison there. And although there are no perfect matches in our laboratory data of meteorites to Ryugu, what we do observe is that the best matches so far are to what we call thermally metamorphosed carbonaceous chondrites. So these are meteorites that experienced water rock interaction in the past. So there was water present. It altered these into clay minerals and other phases, and then were subsequently heated to high enough temperatures to decompose some of those hydrated components, 
but still some of that OH is remained, uh, or retained and remains on the surface to be seen today. And so that is our current uh, interpretation of what this object may represent. Uh, and in terms of what of the object we're actually sensing, we are only seeing the uppermost surface of this object. So we're penetrating perhaps half a millimeter or less into the surface. And we hope to uh, gain more information about the composition in the future with the small carry-on impactor experiment that will penetrate a little bit deeper into the asteroid and provide, hopefully, some additional information. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I am Seiji Sugita of uh, University of Tokyo. Used to be a brown with the Ralph. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to talk about the, uh, uh, the third paper, hopefully not the, uh, the least important paper, but the, uh, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, co-authors. And then uh, um, we have a very similar uh, conclusions uh, from uh, uh, Ralph's result on the Cicero paper, but the, uh, uh, we are using a, a, a camera, multi-band camera in a different wavelength. It's important to have a, reach a same, similar conclusion as a near-infrared, so it makes it, our conclusion stronger. And then uh, the most important point we're trying to do with this third paper is to come up with the uh, general baseline evolution scenario for Ryugu um, coming from a parent body. The reason why we talk about parent body is the following. The, uh, the size of a Ryugu, as you may know, already is uh, very small, like a half a mile, uh, 800, 900 meters across. It's too small to be able to survive the entire solar system evolution of 4.6 billion years. So Ryugu must have been born from a much larger and older parent body in a relatively recent time. It's like several hundred million years. I mean, much longer than our human lifetime, but much shorter than the solar system uh, evolution. So we have to understand the parent body, and then that's a key element of our study. So how do we really approach this? Uh, the key was coming from the, the visible spectra or <coughs> color uh, because uh, we are in a visible wavelength range. Uh, there have been some uh, um, discussions or the controversy about the spectra of Ryugu before we ar arrived there. But once we um, saw the, uh, the actual spectra in a visible spectral uh, wavelength range, we did see very flat, very dark uh, spectra in the visible, very similar to what the NEOS-3 found out. But those matches uh, uh, asteroid called the uh, Bolanum Ularia. Uh, you don't have to know these uh, um, <laughs> proper noun, but the, the, uh, the fact, it's, what's important is that we have, uh, we have identified some proper names of certain asteroid, and those are the two primary candidates. Now, based on those uh, linked to a uh, specific asteroid, we can talk about the uh, longer history of Ryugu in a perspective, because uh, uh, they have uh, a uh, certain breakup period and the size and so forth. So that's what's really helpful. And then again, uh, the color of a Ryugu in a visible range also matches the, uh, the uh, here. The thermally metamorphosed uh, carbon chondrite, very similar to just what Ralph talked about, the same discussion applies. So uh, our inference is that Ryugu's parent body may have experienced uh, thermal metamorphism, you know, only in the history of evolution. And then uh, uh, the second uh, important point is that uh, because our camera is a imaging uh, system, uh, we can have a much higher resolution than the uh, uh, near infrared spectrometer. So we scrutinize individual boulders color one by one. And then what we found out is that there are multiple uh, different types of uh, uh, morphologies and color, lots of variation. But vast majority of boulders we see on the surface of Ryugu is this type. Uh, it's uh, um, uh, rugged and then, um, uh, uh, very dark, but they are the, this comprises of uh, more than 90% of the surface of Ryugu. Those are much rarer and brighter and so forth, but they are the, the fact that those uh, uh, one kind of color and morphology is dominating the surface of Ryugu really implies that material uh, or the apparent body interior of Ryugu was probably very homogeneous. Otherwise, a whole bunch of different uh, spectra stuff must be seen on the surface of Ryugu. It's dominated by one type of color. So uh, it really shows us the, the uniformity of a apparent body of Ryugu. That's one of the very important uh, points. And then when, you, when we measure the, uh, the individual uh, 
bolder colors uh, in a little bit complicated uh, uh, busy diagram here. It's called a principal component anal analysis. Uh, it's being used for a lot of different uh, analysis such as uh, human DNAs and so forth to cluster uh, from one cluster from the other. Making the long story short, the, uh, the view spectral of a regolith from the individual boulders are really uh, um, uh, concentrated around here, which happens to be in a track of a um, hydration track of a um, carbonaceous chondrite. And again, this really uh, is consistent I I with the notion that the Ryugu's parent body may have gone through the thermal dehydration process. And also, uh, impact breccia appearing uh, materials found. It's a uh, angular uh, uh, boulders. When inside, there's a, a small fragments cemented together. That's really showing that the impact happens, some cementation happened later on. Such a complicated geologic process not going to happen that the Ryugu itself has to be happening on the surface of a much larger body, such as the parent body. So um, putting those pieces together, now I think we have a good model of uh, Ryugu's evolution, started with the uh, high degree of uh, water rock reaction. Subsequently, dehydration happened, shattering of uh, um, uh, impact, and then breaking into a small fragments, and then reaccumulation happened, making a, um, a top shape on the regular rubble pile was formed. That's then we found the, the uh, Ryugu on the solar system. So this uh, baseline is a good working hypothesis. We're going to um, 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 uh, test in the future on, uh, hopefully, with the sample uh, returned to the Earth. Now we have in a capsule. And uh, our model may be wrong if we find a really exotic material in a capsule. But that's a really good news. But the, uh, that's what we are looking forward to. And I'd like to add, I run out of time, but the, uh, our effort has been benefited so much from a NASA participating science program. And it's a very good international teamwork. And that's what, what I want to la uh, add in the last. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. We are open to questions. Yes, um, Emily, Lock Emily Lockdewalla from the Planetary Society. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about the hoppers, uh, what they accomplished, how long they lasted, um, and what you learned from them. Okay. <coughs> okay. So uh, l let me answer that. The ho the hopper. You mean the the rovers and lander. Rovers, yes. Yeah, the, uh, we first uh, the de deployed the two rovers called Minerva 21A and 1B uh, in sep uh, last September, and then two of them are, uh, are released uh, in a very healthy condition, and then uh, it lasts. Uh, two of them last for uh, one of them uh, were alive for uh, like a few days, four days or so, and uh, and. The other things, uh, other one is uh, was alive for uh, more than one month, and uh, w what I say about uh, alive is that we uh, retrieved the, the uh, meaningful uh, telemetry data, including images, and and the, but uh, after that we continuously received the uh, s signal, so that means that the uh, two rovers are still uh, active, so. Uh, so, uh, from uh, so later we will try another uh, the, uh, com to establish another communication with the uh, two rovers. So we hopefully we, uh, they may be uh, still alive. Uh, we, we we are not sure about that. And about the lander, uh, which uh, which was developed by DLR and Kunis, our uh, German and French partners, and, and that was uh, actually dr driven by primary batteries. So it uh, is expected; it was expected to leave for about uh, six, uh, 15 hours or so, and it, it actually alive. It was actually alive for uh, 17 hours, and that that corresponds to the three uh, days uh, in in the uh, uh, three asteroid days, which is uh, more than expected by uh, the. Uh, the, the, by the mascot team, and I, I believe they, they are happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Ritzy with Nature. Forgive me if you said this earlier, but the upcoming impactor experiment, where on the surface? Uh, okay, uh, I, I haven't prepared the, the uh, slides. 
Do you have a different PowerPoint? I think so. Do I have appropriate one? I think the map. Okay, we already uh, decided where to to make a crater, which is actually released of March 18th in Japan. Uh, sorry about that. So, yes. So, yes. Yeah. So the, uh, actually, we are going to make a hole around here. Take <laughs> <laughs> <Same> picture, yes. <laughs> so, uh, so the. Uh, the, uh, the kinetic impactor or SCI it, it will be deployed at an altitude of 500 meters and the, the uh, impact accuracy is, uh, we expect it to be uh, like 200 meter uh, ra uh, radius. So it's very large, kind of like this large. So we are expected to have a hole at the same somewhere, somewhere in that very big uh, region. And we will try to find uh, the that uh, the the artificial crater after after a uh, two weeks later and uh, by by descending to a lower alti low altitude and make a uh, the extensive observation. Yeah, so I will answer the first half of the question. So uh, the, 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 we, uh, the spacecraft does not have the, uh, the uh, direct way to, to quantify the, the, the amount of a sample we got. But looking at the, uh, the, the, uh, the Camo H movie, you can see uh, many fragments uh, uh, as a reaction of the uh, projectile ejection. So we expect uh, that's n something we haven't expected, such a uh, dynamical uh, uh, reaction. So we ex we are expecting more than we design. So the or original design value only uh, assumes like one hundred milligram of the uh, the the uh, sample, but uh, we expect. Uh, we are expecting more, but we haven't have any uh, the the uh, value a guaranteed value for for that uh, for for now. But please, uh, uh, so it's a, like a it's to keeping a curiosity until we make our Earth return. So. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. So it's a like a, a present. Souvenir box. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, maybe I can add one thing, and he really answered the, uh, the majority of the things we can say. Uh, one thing I would add is that uh, when you look at the KMH images, uh, you can see that the uh, uh, fragments coming, uh, 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 they speed higher than the spacecraft. So the, the ejection velocity, some of the uh, large portion of the uh, ejection velocity is higher than at the spacecraft. So there should be lots of uh, um, uh, injection into the sampler horn system. So that, that, that's, that's as good as we can imagine. So that's our um, um, answer, and then we're very happy about what happened on the surface. And we don't know how many grams, but uh, <laughs> So the, you mean the uh, clearance, the, like uh, how much are uh, the, the distance clearance. between the, the, yeah, the, it's, uh, the bottom of the spacecraft? So the length of the uh, sample horn is one meter, but because of the uh, some uncertainty in the attitude and uh, some other stuff, so we, uh, we, uh, we are defining the safety uh, height of 70 centimeters. So we actually found out uh, the place 
with the boulders uh, less than se uh, 70 centimeter height. So that's uh, the, uh, the criteria for safe landing. Ex exploding? Yeah. Maybe I can yeah. try to answer. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, the short answer, of course, is no. But uh, the, based on the, uh, we made a really detailed map of the terrain, local terrain, like uh, uh, on the order of uh, 10 centimeters of accuracy. And then uh, uh, there are larger boulders and uh, uh, medium-sized boulders and small boulders. And we're kind of close to the large boulders. But um, uh, the horn didn't hit the place. It was really offside, offset. And then uh, the clearance from the, the largest boulder, I think we saw to the, uh, the bottom of the spacecraft is uh, several centimeters, several, several tens of centimeters. But yeah, that's my best guess right now. And it wasn't that close a call, but the, uh, the, if we had, a, I don't know, another couple of meters away, the uh, clearance may have been smaller. But uh, it was, uh, yeah, that's, that's our assessment. Stephen Clark from Space Flight Now. Um, based on what you know about the surface strength and surface characteristics of the asteroid, uh, how big of a crater do you think the impactor will <laughs> carve out? Uh, what's your best guess there? And do you plan to collect the samples built from inside the crater? Do you have any idea? Yeah, it's a very difficult question because uh, the, uh, s s uh, s some sampling mechanism, it hit uh, uh, two gram uh, projectile, but uh, SCI impact is two kilogram. So it, the scaling law uh, estimate that 10 meter diameter of the crater I, we expect, but I, we don't know exactly what, what size we make. Okay, uh, the, you mean sec second sample, you mean? Or third? Um, you took one, you're going to do the impactor, and then... Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, uh, actually, we uh, probably won't do the third touchdown. Yeah, so, uh, because we spend a, a l lot of time for assessing the first touchdown, and we uh, run out of the time. So, we decided probably... Uh, uh, we we won't do the third touchdown, but second touchdown, we are still planning. No, no, no. Uh, it's uh, a few months up later, uh, after we uh, th uh, pre precisely assess and evaluate the how, how the the artificial crater was is made. Maybe I can try to answer. Um, I, I think uh, there will be a, a, a mass ejecting, I mean, uh, escaping the gravity of uh, um, Ryugu because the uh, escape velocity of Ryugu is very small. I don't remember it exactly. Cent that. 30 centimeters per second or something. Yeah. The ejection in the impact velocity is uh, uh, a couple of kilometers per second. So some fragments should be really um, leaving the, the surface. So we have to really make sure that the, the, the place we're going to land is uh, clear over those uh, fragments. So it'll take some time to make sure. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much. Um, I uh, finally uh, out of dice. So we have three more sessions, two oral sessions and a one poster and a showcase session. So uh, please join. Thank you so much. Thank you very thank you. much. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah.